Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased uh, to be here to speak about the management of severe alveolar defects, which in fact is something that I've always uh, liked and it has always been my greatest passion uh, within dentistry. I wanted to thank Geischlich for putting together this webinar, which is quite uh, exciting to know that we're reaching uh, all around the world, in fact, in places that we don't even know uh, about. So I will be looking very much forward to the Q&A session at the end of uh, the, the lecture. As uh, probably uh, you may have reckoned, I am primarily a clinician who loves uh, clinical research, but who undergoes surgeries on an everyday basis and these are the kind of patients who knock on your door of your practice uh, for which we are entitled to treat in the most uh, predictable and pragmatic way. The, these are all cases where if we want to restore them with an implant supported restoration we have to uh, find a way of regenerating bone whether this is with the guided bone regeneration or other techniques. Um, these kind of cases require um, a, a bone regeneration approach. Now, if we make a little bit, uh, a little step backwards, I'm, I'm very much intrigued by the biological principles of guided bone regeneration. Um, I truly believe that what we actually do on our patients, we must um, understand the biology behind it, which is really fundamental. Now, we all are aware of the fundamental principles of GBR. We have studied these uh, for many, many years now, and they have derived from the guided tissue regeneration literature that we have uh, studied back with uh, Torklet Karing and uh, the, the Swedish authors. So back in the 90s, we were taught that GBR was uh, in fact based on the principles where the physical barrier was positioned on top of the wound to allow for the space maintenance and allow for uh, the bone formation and impede the fast growing soft tissue cells in the area. Now, the fundamental principles can be clinically uh, looked at, uh, for example, through primary wound closure. We can be the best surgeons in the world and rebuild mountains of bone, but if we are not able to close the soft tissues over them in a predictable way, then we will encounter uh, a lot of complications and wound dehiscences, which is in fact the biggest fear when we do the vertical augmentation in the bigger cases. Androgenesis. Androgenesis is the main actor. We are waiting for Mother Nature to do its job and we have to respect this, which, which means that we have to allow for the space and the stabilization of the blood clot. So the blood is something that is crucial. Without it, there's no way that we can achieve uh, the tissue regeneration that we're looking for. And this goes hand in hand with space maintenance. Of course, we want some, uh, some area, some space maintaining tools that allow the soft tissues to avoid collapsing within the area, which of course is, uh, goes in hand with the stable wound and graft material. And that's why we have uh, these brand new uh, grafting materials that are able to allow for space maintenance in an excellent way. Now it's very interesting because the fundamental principles in fact have been questioned and they have been questions from the authors who wrote them in the first place. And I'm referring to Krista Darlin, who wrote in 89 the very first paper on the principles of GBR. And now he has revisited them with the help of Alberto Turri up in Sweden, in Gothenburg, um, in 2016. They published this paper, which I find extremely intriguing and interesting, where they show that the barrier membranes that we use are in fact not passive barriers anymore. They have analyzed them with very sophisticated ways um, and they have shown that they act as bioactive compartments. In fact, they al it's almost as if they were a sponge that uh, recruit the right cells uh, who then express the signals for bone regeneration. And of course, uh, this can be translated into membranes that promote bone formation. We are obviously still at the very early stages of these studies, but this is something that has shed a light on the biological principles, which I truly believe that we want to know when we treat patients, and we have patients who present with these kind of defects in aesthetic areas, for example, we want to be able to understand why we get bone regeneration as such. We want to be able to deeply 
understand and appreciate the biology behind it. And only by doing this, we may improve even our surgical skills. Now, one of the questions that I've been asked more frequently is whether vertical bone augmentation has a long-term predictable stability. Or in other words, if I position my implants in previously vertically augmented bone, how do they behave over the long term? And I've gone into the literature and after our systematic review published in 2008, um, where we came up with a conclusion about this, this was confirmed um, by other authors in 2016. And uh, we can say that implants in vertically augmented bone behave like implants in native non-augmented bone. And we can go further and uh, the authors listed have uh, shown and have used the old Arbuxan 86 uh, success and survival criteria for implants and they have looked that the implants positioned in vertically augmented bone compared to the implants in native bone behave over throughout the years um, in terms of bone loss with coherent with the Albertson criteria of success. Now I'd like to highlight though that these are papers and authors who are extremely skilled, who uh, do this day in and day out, which means the operator skills are extremely important when we do these kind of surgeries. And these are selected patients that have been maintained very well throughout the years. So my message today is do not think that everything can go well just because we have these papers backing up. These papers tells us that if everything is performed following a very strict protocol, then of course the uh, implants behave in a very positive way. Now, one crucial factor when we're talking about how to manage severe available bone defects and especially how to achieve success is the case selection. We spend hours and hours and hours looking at all the diagnostic material that we have. We're very lucky that we have 3D printed versions of our patients, we have a 3D printed models, we have Cobain CT scans with high resolution, we have all the intro pictures that we take on an everyday basis of our patients. And once we do this, and once we sit down in peace after work, looking at the cases of the patient and looking at the patient as a whole, then we are able to select the appropriate case when we're talking about performing such a complex procedure as GBR. Speaking of case selection, I like to um, use the Swiss uh, classification published in 2014, which is a very simple and, I would say, academic or didactic classification. However, I find it extremely uh, useful. They use a traffic light um, uh, colouring to make it easier, and they start obviously with a green light with sufficient bone volume. Um, whether it's sufficient bone volume uh, and you just position your implant or whether you have an intra, very small intraalveolar defect, they suggest the use of resorbable barrier membranes with a particulated bone substitute. If we start moving into larger defects, which for example, uh, the peri-implant dehiscence defects, we can see that this looks like an enormous defect, but in fact, it's a very highly predictable um, uh, in terms of regeneration defect because of its high potential due to the fact that you have three bony walls throwing out the, the blood clot, which we know now from the biological principles, which is fundamental. And, the, and, and, and again, the classification suggests the use of resorbable membranes plus particulated bone substitutes. Now we get into the, the, the more challenging um, areas, which we will see, which are the red defects, which we are, where, where we see a very severe horizontal or in fact a vertical three-dimensional defect. In these cases, in the horizontal rich defects, we can choose between resorbable membranes, which need to be pinned and stretched very well, or non-resorbable membranes. Why? Because we need to keep the space. And in that case, you would have to add either bone substitute materials or autogenous bone blocks. If we speak about the vertical ridge augmentation, then in this case, there, uh, there is no indication to use resorbable 
barium membranes because they don't have the stiffness enough to support the space that we need to create. So we have to use some space maintaining devices. And in this case, for the GBR, non-resorbable membranes, uh, titanium reinforced plus bone substitutes underneath to allow for the ingrowth uh, of, of the angiogenesis or autogenous bone blocks. Now let's have a look at case by case. And I want to start um, by obviously the, the simple cases. Those is a patient who was referred to me and uh, she obviously had uh, through uh, uh, an in-depth analysis of the Cobain CT scan, enough bone volume to just straightforwardly position a dental implant. However, if we look carefully, because we are in the aesthetic area, and she's a, she's a young patient, she's, she has a high smile line, and she's a very beautiful patient with high expectations, if we want to be picky enough, we see that it's the contour is not exactly as we want it to be. So by applying a simple, easy uh, technique of uh, a correct positioning of the implant, now uh, this was, was, was a guided surgery, but in fact it's not necessary for a single central incisor. However, I would advocate always a pre-prosthetic planning. Um, and even nowadays, uh, we position even single implants with a surgical stent at least. Um, because even a fraction of a millimeter, this is this is what I was uh, taught uh, many many years ago. Even a fraction of a millimeter of difference in a distal or mesial or buccal or, or palatal direction makes a huge difference on the final outcome. So when the implant is positioned in the right three um, D position, it is fully embedded in bone. So that's not an issue. However, because we want to improve the aesthetics and we want to achieve a very natural contour and smile we add a connective tissue graft to be able to give that extra soft tissue volume that we're looking for. So in fact, we are following the classification where there is sufficient bone volume. Now let's start looking at cases where in fact we do not have the ideal situation. So this is certainly not a, a tremendous case. However, again, look at the smile line. Look at the smile line of this patient, which is extremely high. She is a patient who has lost the upper left central incisor, and we can immediately foresee that we will have a bone uh, deficiency and a soft tissue deficiency as well. When the implant is positioned in the right 3D position, we can see already a crack in the buccal alveolar bone, and we can see that there is a slight dehiscence. So we perform a traditional, uh, straightforward, horizontal GBR in conjunction with implant placement, where the particles are gently positioned and adapted without over-contouring necessarily the area, and uh, following Again, the biological principles, we cover this with a collagen barrier membrane and a connective tissue graft over lying on top to be able to achieve a nice aesthetic result. And at the end of the day, the patient was finalized with a very natural looking smile. And in fact, the natural tooth on uh, her right hand side um, shows a small grey shadow due to the post and core that was used, but of course this is just a purely cosmetic uh, defect which wasn't bothering the patient at all. The implant itself is looking very much natural. So I will show you now a video that uh, of another patient with uh, a very similar situation and I would like to talk you through this video so that it will give you exactly the, uh, the the tips and tricks about it. So a mid-crestal full thickness incision is performed in a very slow way, in a very controlled way, to allow a 90 degree uh, incision between the papilla and the intracircular incision. This is very important to have a complete closure when we have finished our augmentation procedure. So the area uh, is then uh, reflected with uh, um, a very small periosteal elevator. And this is uh, the scenario that we see six to eight weeks after tooth extraction when nothing is performed uh, in that uh, moment. So the tooth is extracted, left to heal spontaneously. And this is what we find when, uh, which is not surprising, when the tissues are elevated. We perform a full thickness uh, flap elevation. We clean the sulcus very well. And now we have 
some proper bone that is waiting to um, to have the implant positioned, which um, will be positioned in a right 3D positioning, as I was mentioning before. And uh, we realize naturally that there will be a dehiscence. It doesn't look from this vision very important, but it is certainly the dehiscence that requires a GBR. As you see, the uh, BIOS particles are nicely adapted without over contouring. And the collagen barrier membrane is again shaped in the right position so that it covers all the area and it can be either pinned or not. But in this case, the defect was uh, not um, large uh, to justify the pinning of the, of the membrane. And now this is the most crucial portion, which is the releasing incision of the periosteum to allow a completely tension free and passive flap. You, as you may notice, the flap has to almost arrive at the incisal edge of the uh, teeth, and this is what we would call a completely tension free uh, uh, flap, considering that the palatal flap cannot be released by any means. Now, a horizontal mattress suture is always performed, and by the way, the protocol is always the same whether we're dealing with the anterior aesthetic region or whether we're doing the posterior mandible. The protocol is always the same. We never uh, make up things on the way. We always use the same technique, the same suturing. We suture with um, a PTFE suture, uh, which uh, is uh, very, um, it's very easy to use, very pleasant uh, to use, and it does not attract any, any plaque during the healing period. And then we do the intra, uh, uh, the papilla with single sutures, uh, around the contact point and we finish off with a proline 70 uh, obviously always using loops and magnifying there we go for the keratinized uh, crystal tissue to be able to adapt and remember when i mentioned the 90 degrees incision between the crescent incision and the intracellular incision is to be able to allow the papillas in the right position being an aesthetic area to be able to have a perfect closure now let's move into the more challenging scenarios, given that my lecture is about the severe cases. So let's start with um, Elizabeth, who's been, who had been in fact referred to me for an immediate implant placement. Now Elizabeth is a young, uh, healthy woman who uh, is presenting with a, a very deep fractured uh, upper left central incisor. And you can immediately notice, maybe because I am obsessed with tissues and, and I am a periodontist, but if you have a look at the marginal tissue, uh, around the fractured tooth, you can immediately recognize that that tissue is hyperemic and it's definitely not uh, in a healthy status. If I had performed an immediate implant, the risk of a buccal recession would have been extremely high. And I do not like taking risks. When the tooth is extracted in a very atraumatic way, there was the buccal portion was ankylosed to the, to the cortical buccal wall and almost three quarters of the root was covered by the buccal bone, which meant that the alveolar socket was now left with only three walls instead of four. Nothing was done at the time of tooth extraction. Um, this is the CBCT scan due to the fact that the patient had been referred to me for an immediate implant placement, otherwise I would have not taken a CBCT scan prior to the tooth extraction, but I would have taken it after tooth extraction to allow uh, vision of the remaining uh, alveolar bone and the planning of the infant. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the, the protocol that, I, that uh, I have adopted following all the literature, especially from the Swiss group, is that we, uh, the moment we, I extract the central incisor, nothing is performed uh, to allow only the blood clot in the alveolar socket and the uh, soft tissue closure of uh, the soft tissue uh, socket portion uh, by itself. Um, this will uh, be, be naturally healed by the time of only six weeks, after which we are ready to intervene. And we know we are faced with a vertical and a horizontal defect because we have seen during the extraction what had gone uh, away. So we're not surprised at all and we plan uh, with our 3D models uh, in a very predictable way. We plan our 3D reconstruction. Now, an implant would have not been a good idea to be positioned at the same time as the vertical GBR. Uh, I may have achieved primary stability 
uh, that uh, is something that I may have, uh, have, uh, have done. However, having a vertical defect it meant that all the palatal aspect of the imprint would have been exposed. There was a large incisal canal um, and the exact prosthetic position would have been compromised. Um, so I'd rather do things uh, in, a, in a staged approach which allows more control uh, and uh, a better pos implant positioning once the, the bone defect is regenerated. We can see that Elizabeth is presenting with a vertical component, a horizontal component. You can visibly see the nasal spine, and we are in a highly aesthetic position. We are lucky, though, that the adjacent periodontum is healthy. The clinical attachment level of the, the upper right center incisor and the upper left lateral incisor are um, coherent and healthy. And uh, this will then allow us uh, to be able to perform uh, a nice GBR following the bony peaks that we are we, we use as our guide points. Um, a tenting screw is positioned to allow the blood clot formation and the particles of the xenograft uh, to be more stable. It's almost as if it's an umbrella pole. Um, it is positioned in, a, in an oblique way to be able to gain the horizontal and the vertical dimension. The titanium reinforced uh, barrier membrane, it's a polytetrafluoroethylene, it's a PTFE membrane, um, uh, a dense PTFE membrane, is positioned uh, primarily on the palate, almost as if to, to create a barrier. So you're creating a wall which is missing. Once this is nicely secured with um, either tacks or screws, uh, then this will allow for the positioning of the graft inside the, the defect and the coverage of uh, the membrane itself on top of, of, of the defect. Now, as you may notice, the uh, PTFE membrane has to be far away from the teeth, otherwise through the sulcus it may become infected, and it has to be completely stable. Hence, we are using uh, uh, small screws and we are actually pulling the membrane so that it doesn't have any pleats and it is absolutely stable. This is a crucial factor. Remember the biological principles. You can see it uh, in, in an occlusal uh, way, how it is far away from the teeth and nicely stabilized. Um, be careful when you're uh, securing the membrane uh, in such a small area, just be careful not to uh, perforate the adjacent wounds. And this is something that unfortunately sometimes uh, may happen. Um, the whole area is then covered by a collagen barrier membrane because if you look carefully on the a screen on the left hand side you can see that there is some particulated xenograft, the bios particles that are not covered by the PTFE membrane which was a little too short so we are covering this following again the principles of the GBR with a collagen barrier membrane. Now you can see obviously that the, the tissues are closed by primary intention with the same technique as I've shown you in the video before and you can see the large augmentation that we have achieved nine months uh, after the uh, surgery. The timing usually goes from six to nine months. Six months is usually for the smaller cases or the single uh, tooth cases and uh, nine months are for the multiple uh, sites. The soft tissue, uh, when they heal in, an, uh, in a healthy way, they appear um, beautifully solid without any dehiscence and we are then ready to intervene to remove the barrier membrane. This is the only downside. However, we need to position our implants. So in fact, it's only one surgery where the titanium reinforced barrier membrane is removed and we can see the volume of bone achieved in the area, which is um, very much significant. You can immediately notice the head of the tenting screw, the umbrella pole that we've positioned. And we have resolved this case and we have transformed a quite challenging scenario into uh, a clinical situation where you have enough bone to position your implants in the correct 3D positioning. And you can see the before and after even from the crucial point of view. So now we have enough crestal bone to uh, select the position of our implant. So the implant is positioned and as usual connective tissue grafts are used to enhance even more the uh, final aesthetic results. You can see the healing and the final restoration on the day of uh, delivery. Um, this patient has been referred to me uh, in, uh, from Spain, so it is very hard to get hold of her because I would love to see 
how um, things are doing after now uh, five years from from the surgery. This, um, but of course, it's 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 a lovely natural looking uh, result. Now it's always uh, a, a real big challenge when we move and we shift into the most extreme cases in the posterior mandible. Um, the vision is limited in the posterior mandible, and the presence of the of the of the tongue is uh, quite a difficult um, uh, quite difficult to um, to intervene surgically speaking. Um, however, uh, if the technique is followed step by step, then this can be uh, overcome. Uh, as we see, this is a posterior mandible which requires a vertical augmentation and the technique is always the same. Uh, barrier membranes are positioned, cortical perforations are uh, performed always to allow the bleeding and enhance uh, the uh, vascular supply in the area. The grafting material is always a 50% autogenous bone harvested in the same area with bone scrapers and half uh, a, a deprotonized bone and bone mineral so to give the osteoconductivity and the slow resorption manner. This is what we want. We want something that slowly resorbs and maintains the volume throughout uh, all this lifetime. As usual, the membrane is positioned on the lingual aspect first to create the wall that is missing uh, and not vice versa because it would be extremely hard to position it first on the buckle due to vision uh, problems. Uh, so it is always positioned in the lingual and the membrane is nicely uh, pulled and secured by uh, small little screws to avoid any movement whatsoever. The suture is always the same with a horizontal mattress suture and single interrupted sutures on top to be able to have exactly two uh, different layers of suturing, the most uh, internal portions and the most uh, apical, uh, uh, sorry, the most coronal portion of the flap itself. And after a nine months of healing, we can see a beautiful result where um, the, there is a complete resolution of the bone defect. You can see the head of the tendon screw and the implants are nicely positioned in abundant bone where there was nothing before. And because we always want to understand what was going on, uh, Massimo Simeon and, and uh, our group back in 2007 um, we have published uh, what exactly happens inside or under the barrier membranes. And we have taken a call during the implant um, preparation side. And uh, we can see that, as you see from the image, the gray portion is the deprotonized bone and bone mineral and the purple uh, portion is newly regenerated bone. And if we have a higher magnification, we see that the new bone is actually bridging between the particles of the BIOS um, component, which is acting literally like a, a, a pure scaffold. And you can see rims of osteoclasts around the BIOS particles that are, um, in a way, eating away the BIOS particles to leave space for the newly regenerated bone. Kay is another patient that was referred to me for a previously failed uh, posterior uh, set of implants. And as you see, the patient was presented with a very thin, narrow ridge uh, with only one millimeters of keratinized tissue on top of the ridge with a vertical component. The regeneration was performed and nine months later, we were able to regenerate a beautiful, large, wide um, uh, volume of bone where implants could be uh, easily positioned. And, and I would like to highlight the vascularity of this regenerated bone which is highly important. Now Massimo Simeon has performed uh, the next case, which uh, we, our group published um, back in 2008. And uh, it is quite funny to remember that day, the day of the surgery, because we all called it almost the mother of all regenerative procedures due to the large defect that we were confronted with. Um, this was a healthy patient who had uh, had a benign lesion uh, removed uh, uh, and as such she had a devastating defect in the highly aesthetic area. She was a 32 year old patient where the upper left lateral uh, 
incisor and the canine, so a very difficult uh, area to restore, um, had presented with this kind of defect. We're talking about almost a 20 millimeter defect, so a two centimeter vertical defect with absolutely no palatal uh, support or no buccal support. And you can visually see the nasal cavity, which is very close to the apex of the defect itself. Um, the technique has uh, been always the same with the same exact protocol as we saw throughout the presentation where vertical augmentation can be achieved. You, you may notice the cortical perforations, you may notice the two tenton screws in an oblique manner to create and hold the space as well as possible and the uh, titanium reinforced uh, PTFE barium membrane, which is secured again on the palatal side first to allow for the barrier to, to be kept in place. And the buckle portion uh, is then nicely tightened and secured by pins uh, in, in this case. Uh, the graft material again was a 50% autogenous bone and 50% axillograft particles. And the regeneration, which occurred nine months after, was quite uh, significant with the complete resolution of the defect. You can see the two heads of the tentin screws and the positioning of the implant. Now, if you have a look at them radiographically, you see the defect, the uh, post regeneration uh, radiograph with the tentin screws in place, and the implants positioned in purely regenerated bone. And this is the final prosthetic result, which you may argue that it, it's not ideal from a soft tissue point of view in terms of papilla reconstruction, but when you have two centimeter complete defect, um, this is certainly a spectacular result with, uh, with the patient being functional and very happy to be able to carry on. Now, in order to conclude, the uh, technology that we have around us is exceptionally uh, exciting because we are faced every day with uh, exciting uh, technologies, whether it's bioprinting, whether it's 3D printing of organs, um, and certainly what I see in the very near future, I would say, in GBR, uh, given that we are looking into different mechanisms, as I mentioned at the very early beginning, uh, is to be able maybe to enlarge and to be able to use in an everyday manner bioactive materials for our patients, possibly even tailored materials for controlled biological response. And I'm thinking of the tissue engineering concepts. And uh, these, however, will never have to be uh, uh, in a way, they will never represent, I would say, a magic wand. That if we have something different or something new, this will work. The new technology will always be extremely uh, worth testing with an appropriate case selection in any case. And mostly important, appropriate handling and surgical skills, which require a very long learning curve. I like to show this because if... Uh, human beings can recreate a muscle in the bioreactor or even an engineered blood vessel, as you can see from the, this video, then it means that we can easily recreate bone uh, in, in a fairly uh, predictable way for our patients who I introduced you uh, at the very beginning of this lecture. So I thank you very much for uh, your attention and I'm definitely looking forward to a, a dynamic and active Q&A session, which will start very soon. Thank you very much. Shall we start the q and I'm very, I'm very looking forward to this, uh, to this moment. But before we start, can I please uh, remind you that there will be an upcoming uh, webinar with uh, Pascal Valentini, who, by the way, I know personally, and I had the honor to listen to him uh, lecture about the sinus uh, lift and it is exceptionally brilliant I must say he's very practical and he tells you really honestly from A to Z everything about sinus lift and complications it, it will be on October 24th um, so just uh, pin it and uh, save the date because it's really worth it now I'm looking at the iPad next to me because we have some questions already um, please don't be shy um, I'm here to enjoy this moment and um, I have a question which uh, I will read it out to you which says what are the most important factors to achieve success in vertical augmentation and this is a tricky question because I can answer in one second or I can answer in a day 
I'll try to to obviously find um, uh, halfway in between. Uh, I I would like to answer by saying that there are no sh shortcuts in regenerative surgery. In fact, in all dentistry, I believe uh, we don't have to have any kind of shortcuts, which translates into a lo long learning curve, as I was lucky enough to have um, the protocol, the surgical protocol. So the hands. In fact, these hands and our brain have to be absolutely trained. There's no such thing as making up a protocol, if that makes sense. Every time we treat a patient, I know exactly from the numbing to the final suture, exactly every single step. And as much as I know it, the nurses and the staff next to me know it. And to, um, to reply in terms of success, certainly, the incision line, well, the selection of the case, so I give for granted that, of course, after the, the lecture, I've managed to give you uh, that kind of input, and uh, the, the suturing technique and the flat management, the soft tissue management is crucially important. And um, I'm lucky enough to be hosting, in fact, a, a two-day intensive course with hands-on and live surgery here in London for a very small group of people who are very interested. Uh, we have four dates in 2018, and we'll cover uh, very much in depth exactly this, the tip-by-tip -tip and step-by-step -step technical technicality of augmenting vertically with, uh, with these techniques. And if uh, anybody is interested, just go on the website, isabellarocchetta.co.uk and uh, you'll find all the information drop me down an email and i'll be happy to give you information so i have when uh you do the bone augmentation of the lower posterior where do you place the fixation pin lingually do you worry about the lingual nerve so everything is pre-planned with two uh, diagnostic measures one is uh, with obviously the cbct scan so you can see exactly where you're going to use the pins and the second is you have a 3D reconstruction. I always have the little 3D models that I've shown you in the lecture. Uh, and this helps me also with a little aluminum foil to shape the membrane, which I will be putting, the titanium reinforced membrane. And in that position, I can decide where the pins can go. Now the pins, we are lucky enough that we have quite a few substantial you know, brands giving, giving us pins and they can differ in height. So according to where the lingual nerve, then that is the, the, the position. I tend to be on obviously the um, uh, coronal part rather than obviously the apical portion of uh, the, the, the ramus. So you don't need to go deep down because the, the, if you think about it, the reason of pinning this membrane is to keep it completely immobile. So I don't care if it's in one position or another, as long as it's completely immobile. Uh, in fact, in the very severe cases, in the very deep cases, I've recently um, uh, performed the surgery on a 20 millimeter to so two centimeter height defect in the posterior mandible. I had to position it almost at the crest because there was no position, uh, there was no space. Now, hi Isabella, what is your take on socket shield technique? Now, I, uh, I was talking about this with uh, who wrote it, with Marcus Hurtzener and uh, with him directly. And at the moment, we have absolutely no long-term results. This may sound obvious, but if, let's just close your, eye, close your eyes a second and let's think that you have your own daughter or your own wife or husband sitting on the chair. Would you do this not knowing what is happening at the five year standpoint or at the 10 year standpoint? I would not. So I'm a bit, I like to say very cautious or a bit of a chicken if you want to put it that way. I am not interested. The point is I do not experiment anything on my own patients. There is a logic to it, but on the other hand, as I hope I've explained during this lecture, if you do things in a very standard way, um, I am not worried about time when the patient tells me, oh, I want everything immediate. That's not the right approach because we have to respect what mother nature gives us in the sense of respecting biology. So the socket shield technique, in fact, is something that we have to look into it and I am waiting for the results, but certainly at the moment, it's still way too early. And remember that we do evidence-based. So at the moment, this is not evidence-based. Why? 
you do not use LPRF mixed with a graft. Um, there is absolutely no reason. We have the machine in the in the practice, it, uh, and yes, it can be used. It has been shown to be absolutely beneficial, especially for the soft tissues more than the bone itself. Um, so there is absolutely no um, negative aspect about using it. So I would recommend uh, certainly to use it. You can use it in um, as almost as a little membrane on top of the PTFE membrane just below the line of closure and it will not damage anything. So the message is yes, of course you can use it. Uh, to me, it's, it's an extra adjunctive um, portion of the surgery, which I do, do not feel absolutely necessary. I would definitely use it if I have some soft tissue, which is extremely thin biotype and the keratinized tissue is very scarce. So certainly that would be an indication. Which are the limitations? This is a very good question. Thank you very much. Which are the limitations of vertical bone augmentation? The limitations is very simple. I always like to explain it to the students of the course. Think of it as a U shape. Now the defect, every single defect that we can treat in vertical augmentation needs to have a U shape, whether it's like this wide or very narrow, it has to have a U shape. So we are limited by the mesial and the distal bony peaks that are adjacent to our defect. That is the limit. At the moment, we unfortunately cannot go beyond that limit. So that is the limit. So if we have a very large defect, but very healthy uh, clinical attachment level to the adjacent teeth, then that is a very, very promising um, defect to treat. On the other hand, if we have a flat horizontal ridge, typical cases of periodontally, chronic periodon periodontally compromised patients which have not been treated, the, uh, the, the alveolar bone has reabsorbed in a horizontal fashion or in a horizontal manner without bony peaks, then I'm afraid the GBR is uh, not applicable. Um, what is your experience on medical augmentation when you have patients with severe defects and chronic aggressive periodontitis? Chronic and aggressive periodontitis has to be completely treated before you even touch the patient. And this is true for implants as well, and I think you know this already. So I do not treat any single uh, patient who has not undergone a thorough periodontal treatment. You consider that I'm a periodontist, so my main job is to actually treat periodontal disease. So this is certainly something that has to be done uh, prior to uh, the history of chronic or uh, aggressive periodont periodontitis, excuse me, does not affect uh, the result of the bone regeneration. Well, we have a huge amount of questions, which I'm very excited about, but I hope I'm gonna answer all of them. In the vertical case defect where bone was augmented, in one of the initial cases, you showed an alveolar resorbed crest after the extraction. Why did you not perform preservation? In case you perform, how precisely you perform? Okay, so um, I used to do every single anterior sector. I used to uh, socket preserve everything. Uh, quite a few years ago, it was around six years ago, we were told that uh, socket preservation was almost like a magic wand, but it was in fact um, untrue. And uh, as usual, I like to be very honest. And uh, after hitting my head on failures and after failures and failures, I looked into it and I, and I started to understand why this was happening. So my philosophy for socket preservation is very simple. Whenever we have to extract a tooth, you obviously have to look at what is left. If there is, and first of all, socket preservation is the wrong word because we're not preserving any socket, which is the soft tissues, but we are, we are t talking about um, the alveolar bone, but that's a bit pedantic of me. You have, to look, uh, you have to look at the anatomy and the shape of the alveolar bone that is left. Now, you tell me how many cases of teeth that require extraction, because we want to save as many teeth as we can, that require extraction have an intact or almost intact Alveolar, alveolus on 360 degrees or four wall defect. Very, very few. And most of them will have lost at least a third of the buccal bone, considering that the bundle bone is lost in every case. And that is approximately one to 2.2 millimeters uh, in, in the most um, coronal portion, which is the most important from an aesthetic point of view once you go and put an implant. So long story short, yes, you can preserve, 
that A, you have to have the most intact ice cream cone, so the four walls, otherwise you're not preserving anything. B, this implies waiting time. Do not enter before the four month time frame, or even possibly six months or 12 months. So the timing, sorry, six months or eight months, the timing is extremely long, but you have to allow that bone, well, that scaffold to allow the, the, the native bone to come there. Um, and uh, so in fact, uh, following also the Swiss experience, uh, Ronnie Young and uh, we have discussed this together, it is uh, the protocol is to remove the tooth, do absolutely nothing to be able to intervene very rapidly. Six weeks later, you're only waiting for the soft tissue closure and at that point, with your CBCT scan, you have the bone which is a virgin bone and you can then plan your implant in the right position if you have enough for, for primary stability with or without GBR or GBR alone and then the implants. So I hope I've been, obviously this is a topic of, you know, that this question requires probably a full uh, lecture about it uh, with diagrams and things, but I hope I've replied. What happens to the vertical screws that are placed during the grafting? Okay, so the vertical screws are the tenting screws. The tenting screws are used and the purpose of them are only to keep the particles, when you have a large defect in a mesodistal direction, usually around two to three edentulous uh, spaces, it's, uh, they are used, one or two, in an oblique way to basically hold the graft, uh, the particles, the xenograft particles in place. Now, they are, they are used as an umbrella pole. I myself experienced a very severe uh, complication because the, 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 the tenting screw was positioned not um, basically at the level of the bony peaks, slightly taller than the bony peaks, and that was a massive mistake. So if you use it, you have to be careful to put the head of the screw uh, slightly more, uh, slightly lower or slightly more apical to the, to the adjacent bony peaks, and that allows for no pressure in the area. Now, what happens with them? It's very simple. You remove it because obviously you can't leave a screw because that will be probably the position of your implant. So it is left for the six or nine months of healing and then this is removed when the implants are um, positioned at the same time of PTFE membrane removal, screw removal, implants insert. That's the, the protocol. Okay, what is the management for vertical releasing incision in the highly aesthetic areas, have you seen a need for scar revision? Absolutely not. If the uh, incision is performed uh, correctly, then there are uh, almost never scars. I tend to release vertically be, um, distally to the canines. This is obvi for obvious reasons. So I am not scared of elevating a larger flap when everything is maintained. Um, and there is no disease, of course, uh, which, which implies that you're doing GBR. So definitely this all to the canines if you have to do it. How do you treat severely congenitally thin mandibular ridge in the anterior region? What type of suture? Oh no, that's another one. What type of suture do you use? How do you treat severely congenitally thin mandibular ridge in the anterior region? Uh, again, this is the same concept. If there is a, a U-shaped defect with bony peaks, then that's certainly with, with, with a GBR. If not, we have to undertake the, um, the classical autogenous block procedures. What type of suture do you use? I definitely recommend PTFE suture. It's a monofilament. It doesn't attract plaque and you can leave it for up to 12 to 14 days and it's extremely um, user-friendly. The only downside is that it's expensive, but Budget and expense should never go um, against the best for the best of the patients. Okay, so you do not advocate socket grafting and prefer to allow for natural healing after extraction. Yes, I've already explained this. Certainly, yes, I just want the soft tissues. This is extremely important. And then I go in and I've got my virgin, beautiful bone, and I can work my way around it. Hi, Isabella. Thank you for the great presentation. Thank you very much. In situation where gross posterior ridges are rebuilt, we often will lose sulcus depth. Absolutely correct. How do you manage the situation where sulcus depth is lost due to coronal events? Sorry. How do you manage the situation where the sulcus depth is lost due to the coronal advanced flap closing over the large graph? You are absolutely correct. And it is a, a big um, issue. And I would say that 99% 90% of the posterior cases that I treat 
low a mandible, require a free gingival graft uh, at the time of healing abutment connection. So we have done all the surgeries, we have augmented, we have removed the membrane, we have positioned the implants, we have left them because they are never loaded, we have left them for four months in the newly regenerated bone, and at that moment, it's the time for two things. In the posterior, for a free gingival graft to re-establish the depth, and that has beautiful results, and for the long-term uh, prosthetic margins and the maintenance of the patient in terms of brushing, this is very viable. And the second option, if you're dealing with the anterior aesthetic for connective tissue graphs, or I mainly do, possibly uh, all my aesthetic cases have connective tissue graphs. Maybe I'm a bit obsessed. In order to avoid the hissances, is not mandatory to use BioGuide over PTFE membrane. I really don't understand a little bit the question, but the point is the BioGuide over the PTFE membrane is not to avoid the hissances this would be a lie and this would be um, an incorrect statement. The bioguide of the PTFE membrane is positioned in case you have a soft tissue dehiscence, which is totally unrelated to whatever is the underneath, it's related to your management of the soft tissues, then it will give a layer of protection more uh, just for a few days, because as you know, the bioguide when exposed, it just um, uh, reabsorbs very quickly. Uh, for the protection of the underlying membrane. But if you have a dehiscence, you have a dehiscence, which is a complication. And again, um, I would have loved, and we can stay here, we can do another webinar probably on only on complications. This is what I do during my two-day course. We go through every single complication, which I had explaining exactly why and how to treat it and how to get out of it, because that's obviously very important. Okay, um, what do you think about the use of PRP in GBR? Uh, well, PRP, again, the platelet-rich plasma is something certainly not new. It's been, uh, it's been around from, from the early 90s. Uh, definitely, I would say, at the moment, unnecessary. Uh, rather, the LPRF has shown to, have, to be uh, more efficient in that sense, in terms of uh, angiogenesis and in terms of vascularity. Um, so definitely, I would uh, I would not recommend using the PRP because there are no studies at the moment that show that using PRP with GBR in conjunction with GBR um, improves dramatically. In on the other hand, we do have studies that show that using uh, PDGF, which is a completely different thing, platelet derived growth factors, yes, that improves dramatically the volume and the um, timing of bone regeneration. Okay, in the cases shown with severe vertical defect, how good is it to use block grafts instead of particulate? Now, if you think of using block grafts, um, I do not have an interaction with you guys, but are you thinking of using a block graft underneath the PTFE membrane? I have recently, last year, published a paper exactly on this topic, the difference between a block, autogenous block grafts, and particulated under the same membrane. So I would recommend you to go and have a look at that. Now, the block has a major, I mean, the point of this technique, which I find very exciting, is that whatever defect you have, you're not touching it. Because whatever anatomy it is, even if it looks like a roller coaster, goes up and down, which is, not, which is nature, which is what we find, then you can cover with the membrane and use whatever the defect is giving you to augment. If you have a block, the block has to have an intimate contact with the alveolar bone, otherwise you will have a, a, a fast growth um, of, a, of connective tissue that will be interposed between the block and the alveolar bone. Um, so definitely I would not recommend the autogenous block. And also for the morbidity of the patient, the whole point of all of this is to just open a little box, mix it with the autogenous bone harvested with the safe, with the, with the bone scrapers, and that will obviously heal very well. I recently had the case of missing 13, 12, yes, 22 and 23. There was a very large defect. There had been previous surgeries in the areas and there was a tremendous scar tissue, not good. I was therefore very difficult to get a passive flap. Any advice of these situations? I had a very, very similar situation and I think I didn't bring it to your attention. Um, he, was a, he was a lovely gentleman with exactly the same area, shorter, because it was only two teeth. Um, the scar tissue is tremendous, I must say. There is nothing that we can do 
to soften up a scar tissue. The only thing is to release it as much as possible, unfortunately more in the apical portion rather than the coronal, because the, the scar tissue is probably in the keratinized band. So um, there is nothing uh, magical, unfortunately, that we can do to get it more passive flap. Uh, we have two minutes and we have like 57 questions. So <laughs> um, in the mandibular vertical defects, you use gingival grafts after the bone regeneration. Yes, as I mentioned, only in the posterior. How long do you wait for the gingival graft? The gingival graft is positioned and after six to eight weeks, uh, the gingival, the, everything that is soft tissue has uh, integrated and you can start with the provisional every, every time with the provisional crowns. How big has to be the defect until it can use BIOS and not a tolerous bone graft? Okay, this is a good question. There has been a study by Canullo uh, showing vertical augmentation with 100% uh, BIOS particles, which have been uh, quite successful. However, I would always advocate the use of autogenous particles due to the osteoinductivity uh, and it does not cost a single thing because you take it in the same area. So you're not scraping off anything else, patient doesn't feel a thing and you're giving the osteoinductivity. Uh, can an implant be used as the tenting screen vertical augmentation? Absolutely yes. Uh, you can use the, uh, the implants together with the vertical augmentation to one uh, recommendation. Obviously, the implants have to be positioned in the perfect prosthetic position. So if you have enough bone to stabilize them, then absolutely yes. How long to, do you wait to remove the sutures? 12 to 14 days. What is exactly the bone substitutes you use in the defect? 50% autogenous bone in particles and 50% uh, bios uh, or xenograft particles. How do you handle the deficient soft tissue during vertical bone augmentation and posterior mandible? Again, the deficient soft tissue, it happened uh, not very often. Sometimes you just need one millimeter of keratinized tissue. That's enough. Uh, if that is missing, I would do a free gingival graft before we even start. And in that case, I would wait six months of healing before we even touch the patient. How do you handle, no, I've already read this. Do you ever use alveolar ridge preservation to avoid soft tissue collapse. I've already uh, replied to this previously. Thank you for your good lecture. Thank you very much. I have one question. How about using RHBMP2? BMP2 is a very strong morphogenetic protein, which would be excellent and amazing to be used. There are so many studies showing um, um, excellent results in using it. It's extremely expensive. So it is unjustifiable. It's unjustifiable to use it in dental purposes. Um, and again, the same question, what about using implants instead of tempting to? Yes, you can. You just have to make sure that your management of the soft tissues is, so, is excellent because if you have a dehiscent with implants, then it's gonna be a big problem because you have to throw away everything and even financially for the patient is not ideal. Now, the time is uh, over. Thank you so much for the wonderful questions. I hope I managed to answer almost all of them. I'm sorry to the people who I have not managed to go through uh, the, the questions. Let me remind you, Pascal. Pascal is waiting for you on October the 24th at uh, 7 p.m. at the same time as uh, me, I think. Uh, well, no, he's in France, so in the UK is an hour difference. Please register because I recommend it to you uh, sincerely because I've listen to him and it's really, really good. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed it.